first. So let's go to pH first. What's normal for pH? All right. 7.35, 7.45. Uh, next one, we're going to go PaCO2, also known as PCO2. What does the little a stand for? Always good to know if somebody says, is that PCO2 or PaCO2? They're the same thing. What do you think the little a stands for? Arterial. So it is going to be a little bit different than PVCO2, which we'll never look at. But if you get into hemodynamics, you're going to look at PaO2 and PVO2 and look at oxygen that transfers off the tissue. So the little a stands for arterial. We'll talk about a big A here shortly too. So what's normal value for this? 35 to 45. 35 to 45. If you're ever in question, it just comes directly from your pH right here. You see you got 735, 745. So if you're doing a blood gas test, I'm going to tell you this is what I did also. You know, when you got to put your stuff away, and I don't know if they still do it this way. They hand you the test, and then immediately I would write the normal values right on right there. If you can get that done and get the normal values memorized, these are very, very easy. So this is measured in what units? MMHG. MMHG, which is, is that a volume? It's a pressure. So it's real funky. We'll, we'll kind of relay that back in a little bit, but that is a pressure. They call it partial pressure. So let's look at PaO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial system. What's normal for that? 80 to 100. 80 to 100, and I put an asterisk next to it because this has mesomillimeters millimeters mercury, asterisk. This has really nothing to do with acid base balance, but I'm going to give it to you on every blood gas that I give you today. So uh, I'll put a little box around it too. And the star means that's on room air. So that's breathing room air. That number and that normal value will change every fraction of oxygen you change on your patient. So this number, if you ever see a PaO2 on a patient, it means absolutely nothing unless you know how much oxygen they're on. So if somebody just gives you their PaO2 is this, it doesn't matter. You have to know their amount of oxygen that they're on. So. And the next thing is bicarb. Now this is pretty Important in acid base balance. What's normal for bicarb? 22 to 26. Great. And what is that measured in? MEQ over liters. Milliliters per liter, and that's a volume. So that's a good thing to know also. So now that we've written this on our test, we know that this is the, our normal values. Now I'm going to do the arrows. Yep. What's the value for the last one? <clears throat> Milliliters per liter. MEQ oh. per liter. Yep. Also measured in millimoles per liter. And so every facility you work at may have a little flux in the normal value of bicarb. <clears throat> this number is really cool. So maybe too much for today, but I'll tell you. If you've ever looked at any blood tests on a patient and you see a venous blood test come back and you get a test that's called a TCO2. Has anybody seen that before on a venous blood test? If you haven't, that's okay. But without even drawing an arterial sample, if we're doing a venous sample where you're doing electrolytes and all that stuff, we see a TCO2. That gives you a good idea of what this bicarb is in the arterial system. Now, I'll come back to that and see if you can connect some dots at the end. So, put this guy over here. That's from a venous sample. We have these TCO2 samples on every patient in the hospital right now. We don't have arterial blood gases on every patient. So, we'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, let's look at the... Which side of these normal values called, cause acidosis or alkalosis? So I just kind of go through it this way. So less than 7.35, is that acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. Very good. Sounds like everybody was in unison. Can you see this marker? Wow. Can you see that? Pink? <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. What about greater than 7.45? Alkalosis. Alkalosis. I'm staying on black. All right, so what about a CO2 less than 35, acidosis or alkalosis? Alkalosis. A little bit of a mix, but it is it's alkalosis, and greater than 45 is? Acidosis. Acidosis, the exact opposite, so acid. All right, alkyl and acid. So we said PaO2 has nothing to do with acid-base balance. Let's go down here to this. Bicarb less than 22. Acidosis. Acidosis, great. 
and greater than 26 is alkalosis. Okay, <clears throat> so this, this would be a lot to write on your test, but if you can memorize a couple of these and why they happen, it will help you quite a bit. So um, with this, I can do any interpretation of, of a blood gas. So let's just talk about a blood gas starting off. So I'm going to write one up here on the board. 7.25, 65, 80, and 24. <clears throat> so the slashes between numbers, if you see these in a chart as shorthand, that always means a blood gas. And when you're looking at it this way, has anybody seen this before? When you're looking at it this way, it's always this way. pH, PCO2, PO2, and bicarb. So I wrote those really small so you can't see them, but that's the way it kind of goes, straight down that list there. That's how when you read a blood gas to anybody. So if I come up to a physician and they say, what well, is a blood gas? And I say, it was a 7, 2, 5, 65, 80, and 24. They'll, they can break that down, mostly colonologists, but they can break that down and know that it's this type of blood gas, which we'll go into. So when you're reading those values, they always go in that order. <clears throat> Remember I put PaO2 in there? Although it has nothing to do with acid-base balance. We're still going to look at when we draw that blood gas. So let's go through this blood gas, and we're going to go through and call each one of these numbers what it is from this values table over here, normal values table. So 725, is it acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. Acidosis, okay. 65, acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. Acidosis. We're going to say this is normal just because we assume they're on room air. It's not documented. We're assuming it right now. And what about this? Normal. Normal. All right. Okay, so now that we've named every one of these, blood, these, these values, now we're going to actually say what the name of this blood gas is, okay? So let's start right here. I'm actually going to go, and you name blood gases backwards of all things. So uh, you start with this side, and you're going to move that way, and I'm going to show you this method. So this spot right here is going to have a couple different things. It's going to say acidosis or alkalosis. Okay, so one of those two options there. In the middle, you're going to have respiratory or you're going to have metabolic. And you got three options on this side. This is going to be uncompensated, partially compensated, or fully compensated. So that's, that's the easiest way to read a blood gas. You're just going to kind of go from that side to this side, picking one of those different names. Okay. So if we look through this, this is going to be the main name of our blood gas on this side. <clears throat> Whatever your pH says, acidosis, dacalosis, is going to go right here. So obviously, it's acid. We're going to do acidosis. <clears throat> the next one gets a little funky because we have to look into this blood gas a little bit. You're gonna find which one of your systems match your pH. So we think about PaCO2, okay, that's arterial CO2 directly related to ventilation. Now when I use the term ventilation, I'm talking about getting air out of your lungs. So that's what, that's what our machines do, our ventilators do. They actually get air out of, out of the lungs. We can't force air across the alveolar capillary membrane. They'd be called respirators. We don't call them that, we call them ventilators because they put air in and they pull air out. If we put a ton of air in, but don't pull any air out, that's where our CO2 is gonna start rising. We have to get them to exhale. And you'll see that with a lot of disease processes where they have trouble. So CO2 is related directly to the respiratory system. What's gonna to happen to somebody's CO2 if they, their breathing rate slows down? Their volume gets small and their rate gets small. Retain CO2. Retain CO2 or their arterial CO2 is gonna go up. Good. They're gonna become more acidotic. What happens if somebody hyperventilates? They take larger volumes on top of, let's say, a faster rate. Expelled CO2. CO2 goes, yeah, it's expelled. Their arterial CO2 goes down. <clears throat> The great thing about CO2 is you can change it extremely fast. CO2 changes really quickly. So as they're breathing, really, as they're breathing, you can change your CO2 in 30 seconds. So if you start breathing fast and deep, your CO2 will start dropping. So fast changes are usually your CO2. 
Let's go over to your bicarb. So how is your bicarb controlled? Kidneys. Kidneys. Good. So it's controlled by the kidneys. So it's definitely the metabolic system. Do you know generically how the kidneys control it? Bicarb or retain it through the tubules? Okay, so yeah, you, you're really close. So you had you said excrete or retain bicarb. So what you're actually looking at is you're excreting or retaining hydrogen or acid. So what happens is, and I'll just write this real quick on the board, but if you have bicarb, <coughs> there's this there's this equation that you've probably seen, carbonic acid equation. Now sorry. I know I'm, I'm messing too. We're not we're not super adept in chemistry, but there's this thing called carbonic acid equation, and what happens is is if whatever one you have more of causes more product in a certain way. So to decrease somebody's bicarb, what do we do? The if you have more hydrogen in their system, whereas your your kidneys are not getting rid of hydrogen or the acid, it's going to bind to this, it's going to decrease the bicarb, it's going to force everything this direction. So you, lots of acid in the system, your bicarb is low. The next one is, if you have, if your bicarb is high, you have less in the system because your kidneys are getting rid of more. So your kidneys control your acid-base balance, but know that your bicarb changes slowly. It should never change quickly. What are some disease processes that might affect your acid uptake and excretion. Kidney disease, that's the easiest one, right? Renal failure, what happens is their bicarb is really low because it's not getting rid of hydrogen and it's doing all this binding to this and dropping the bicarb level and making them really acidotic. We'll come back to that in a second. So know that anything to do with this bicarb side is gonna be metabolic. So in this case, which one of these two, respiratory and metabolic, match the the type of pH we have. Respiratory, respiratory right? Because we have acid for this one and we have acid for this one. Okay? So this is going to be respiratory. And the next one we ask when we go down this side is, are we getting any help from the other system? Are we getting help? <clears throat> so, is, in this case, if we stayed in this state, the kidneys would start to, what would they start to do? Would they start to hold on to hydrogen or get rid of hydrogen? Release it. What was that? Would they release the hydrogen and make it less acidic? Yes, so they want, the bicarb to, they want the bicarb to raise, so they would start getting rid of hydrogen, and then the bicarb would start to raise, and then offset this, this acidosis to respiratory side. But are we getting any help from our kidneys right now? No, because this is still in normal range, okay? So we're not getting any help. We'll come back to this to make more sense in a second, so that's okay if you understand it. So we're not getting any help at this time. Our bicarb carbs within normal limits. It hasn't moved any direction at all. So we call this <coughs> uncompensated. So this blood gas is uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Okay, so with normal oxygenation. So let's go into another one. Now, let me give you a little hint. The only way to be fully compensated <clears throat> is to have a normal pH. We don't have those very often, but I'll show you an example of them. So, let's do another one. Seven five three twenty four one ten and twenty five. Go through it methodically. Don't jump the gun on it, even though you think you know it. So go through here. That's alk. That's alk. That's normal to high. Oh, well, they don't know what they don't know what FiO two they're on or oxygen. And then this is normal. So we take whatever's right here, alkalosis, and it goes right here. All right, and then we take, we go in this direction. So whichever one matches, which in this case is the respiratory system, 
At least it's not my phone. <laughs> that's right. So pH and CO2 match, that's a respiratory system. Are we getting compensation from the other side? No, so we're uncompensated. Uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. Tell me about this patient. What might you see from the door? <clears throat> could be, yeah. So they could be hyperventilating, but we don't really know why. So two things that control ventilation, tidal volume, so that's the amount of air they take in and their respiratory rate. They could have one of the two be high. Now, you could have normal tidal volume, maybe 500, 600, 10 mLs per kilogram, and you could have a respiratory rate that's 20 or higher. Or you could have somebody taking slow respiratory rate, but really big volumes. That will also get rid of more CO2. So we think of that, if seen by seen, um, a, a patient or a person in a post axial state. So after a seizure, the respiratory rate will commonly be very low, but their volumes will be huge because they'll be compensating for that low respiratory rate. That's their brain doing that. So yeah, you could say this could be if somebody panicking, um, it could also be somebody in pain, a lot of times if they're in pain, or if the oxygen was low, we could say they're hypoxic, cause them to breathe fast. But in this case, I would not say this is a ventilatory issue, so it's something else going on. But that's where it gets like, if it was a ventilatory issue, that's easy to fix. These ones are hard because now you've got to go through what could be causing hyperventilating. So. Now the funny thing is with this blood gas, if you're, you're working with me and you're the nurse for this patient this day, I probably ran this blood gas and I called you and I said, Nurse Smith, this is Jimmy in respiratory and I have a panic of CO2 of 95. And then they would say, okay, thank you. And I'd hang the phone up. Because if I drew a blood gas of any type and I have a CO2 value that's higher than 60, I've got to call it to a nurse or a physician. That it, I call it to the nurse knowing that they're going to call it to the physician. So it's going to get, it has to get back to the physician because we can't just have a bad value and then just totally not report it. It's just kind of like a regulatory. So I called you with a panic value. That doesn't mean you need to panic by any stretch of the imagination, but you need to know what kind of blood gas they have. Some of our patients live with panic values. That's the crazy thing, but they do live with panic values, but the body is amazing and it's compensated for it. So let's go through this blood gas though. This person's not doing quite as well. Acid or out? Acid, very acid, normal, okay, so we're going to look over here, we have acidosis, and then which one of these respiratory or metabolic match our pH? Respiratory, everybody understand that? When I say match, I mean they're both acid, so respiratory, and then are we getting help from the other side? Yes. Okay, good. So we can mark out the uncompensated. Is the pH normal? No. No. Partially compensated. So partially compensated respiratory acidosis. Tell me, you have a question? No, I was just... That's all good. Tell me about this patient. What might you notice from this patient? From the, Okay, so what, what may be the history for this patient? COPD. Could be. COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. So that means they're going to retain CO2. There are, and I won't go into this today, but there are five different disease processes that fall under COPD. Cystic fibrosis is one, and bronchiectasis, asthma, um, chronic bronchitis, and the biggest one's emphysema, directly related to cigarette smoke. So that we kind of relate COPD to emphysema, but there's all these other ones. And the, but COPD uh, presents the same in the fact that you have obstruction to expiratory flow. That means you can't ventilate well, so your arterial CO2 is always higher. Why would you think that's COPD? What number on here would tell you that this has not happened last night? Partial pressure CO2? 
Partial pressure CO2. Well, actually, CO2 can change real quick. It's going to be the bicarbonate. It's the bicarb. Because remember, the bicarb is controlled by kidneys, which is a slow mover. So it takes a long time to get to this. It to take hours, days, weeks for you to be able to get to that bicarb and maintain that. So especially to go up that way. So that's why we call it COP. That's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So we kind of think of it that way. Now, that could be one issue. What's another? It's mainly going to be a COPD. I'll go with that. Um, right now, though, they're not doing well because they're, they're maybe breathing fast or something like that because although this 95 is here, this is still acidotic. So their arterial CO2 on a normal day is probably, probably something more like 70. But their body's compensated for 70. But now what we have is we call this respiratory failure. But, but we call this acute respiratory failure because the pH is acidic. And then on top of chronic respiratory failure because they have COPD. So we can say they're chronically failing because we know this is high too. So this is acute on chronic respiratory failure. So this is your COPD patient that comes in that's in the exacerbation. And they need help. What might we help them with? What, might, what device might we use? This is kind of next level, so it's okay. Mask. What's that? A non-rebreathable mask? Non-rebreather mask. I like the answer. That's wrong, but yes, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good answer. I love you used a proper term for a respiratory device. I like it. So I was looking. What we could use what we call a ventilator, putting an, an endotracheal tube down and putting on a ventilator, although we don't like to do that. They're not super far off. It really, sees, it really depends on how the patient presents. Commonly, we'd use what's called a BiPAP, or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It's the mask on the face that helps to ventilate them. So it's a non-invasive way of ventilating them without putting a tube down. So you'll, you're going to see, you're going to have to know those so much in your career. So BiPAPs, you're going to have to know. BiPAP is a generic term too. We call it NIPPV, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. I've got tons of videos on that if you're going to watch. Because that is like one of my number one questions. What is the difference between these devices? Because right now at the hospital, we own about 30 of those devices. And we're renting about 20 of them. So, I mean, I mean, at least probably 30% of the patients in the hospital are on something like this, especially COVID or somebody in respiratory failure. So, and then, you, and then you're not even counting in the people that have obstructive um, uh, sleep apnea that are on CPAP at night that we have to maintain while they're in the hospital too. So, all those different respiratory devices. Okay, so partially compensated respiratory acidosis. Let's do another one. Okay. I just like the old baby to make this easy. It's a bad day. So let's go through and methodically do this blood gas. So we have acid or alkyl normal. Acid, alk, normal, acid. So acidosis, we go over here. Which one matches? Is it the respiratory or the metabolic system? Metabolic. Metabolic, good. And are we getting help from the other side? Yeah, we're getting some. It's trying to help out. Is it enough to get normal pH? No. So. Partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Okay, so we named one disease process that could cause a metabolic acidosis. There are two other big ones. Yes, two other big ones that you may we may have. Diabetes. Yes. So type one, not necessarily just diabetes, but diabetic ketoacidosis. So the initial presentation of it, non-controlled. So blood sugars. When you get to your glucometer, it just says high on it, which is not good. It means it's greater than 600 on a blood sugar. By the way, I have seen my highest blood sugar ever on a COVID patient, 1,400. I didn't think that we, we could measure that high. It was crazy. So, 1,400. I've only seen 1,000, but now I saw 1,400. So, really interesting. So, DKA is one of them. Yes. Okay. So, that's, that's one. 
The other one we said earlier was kidney disease, so or renal failure. Or shock, or cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest. Actually, yeah, kind of. Cardiac arrest. So if you have cardiac arrest, your bicarb starts to fall immediately because your kidneys stop working. So we'll kind of relate that to the kidneys failing. There's another one that's a little bit more progressive, probably not in this case, but it kind of happens over a longer period of time. Alcoholism? What is it? Alcoholism. Alcoholism? So that would be, no, not, not that long. Let's say like over three days. Diarrhea. Diarrhea. So you could lose, so there's, you know, I, this would be really bad. This would be like taco casita type bad diarrhea. So, you, would, you could lose a lot of, you lose base from your butt, right? So if you had a lot of diarrhea, like really, really bad diarrhea, it, you could somewhat go down, but I don't think you'd go that low. Metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome, yes. Okay, so let me, let me, let me just pull back a little bit. So the one I'm really looking for is more, <clears throat> um, I don't know how the best way to put it. Anyway, you come in the hospital, let's say, Let's say somebody presents from um, a nursing facility and they have an indwelling catheter. And they come into the hospital and they're febrile. And you're going to start checking their temperature and you're going to do white blood cell count and that's elevated. And if it's not properly treated over time, what do they go into? Shock or what type of shock? Septic shock. So I'm looking for sepsis. All right, so I'll really pull that one pretty hard. That's okay. That's all right. That's a, that's a hard one to get out and hard one to explain. So sepsis actually causes, because when you're septic, you actually go into anaerobic respiration. We know with anaerobic respiration, you're doing it without oxygen. Lactic acid's building up. Lactic acid drops this, because it is the same as acid, just like this. So it drops that. From the door, if you walk in from the door and see this patient, what, how will they present? How could they present in e any one of those three type of disease processes? From the door assessment. Not always. Not always. But they're not doing well in this case. Flush and sweaty. Flush and sweaty. They may look ex and they, what would you, what else might you notice? So the patient's right there at the podium, and you walk up, and what are you going to notice about them? Their skin, anarchic. Could be, could be, what else? Loss of consciousness. Could be lethargic. I'm looking at something else from the blood gas. They could be blue, but our, I mean, we're not super cyanotic. I mean, it's 80. I believe that's only there. About the 21. Okay, so let's step back. What if they're DKA? Small respirations. Two small respirations. Now, since you gave the right answer, you got to demonstrate it for everybody. Um, With your mask on. <laughs> I just know it's like, wow. It's like, I don't know. I can't. I know. <laughs> that was a perfect example. It's fat. In this case, two things, fast and deep. So it's fast and deep. And so the patients will present... This patient, if they're in DKA, they'll present with respiration so I can see fast and deep. So when I look at somebody, I'm not a super creeper, but I'm a respiratory therapist, so I always look at people's clavicles on their assessment. And I look at the depth of the respiration. For some reason, I always go right to their clavicles because I'm not looking at just their rate. I'm looking at chest excursion. So with DKA and Kussmaul's respirations, it's... I look at how much, they're, how much work they're putting into this. Now, the whole thing is, is they're not doing that consciously. This is all subconscious. This is actually controlled by uh, uh, the pons in your respiratory centers, the pons, sending triggers down to your, to your diaphragm saying, breathe, 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 because that's the only way I know to fix acidosis. That's the body's, so that's the funky thing. So that's the body's fix for everything. If there's actually sensors in your brainstem, and when it senses... Acid blood. It doesn't care if it's respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis. The sense is acid. It just gets sends shot down to the, to the diaphragm. And says, "Breathe, breathe, breathe, breathe," because that's how it fixes it. It lowers the CO2 and, and fixes it. So, if this patient presents and you think that they are anxiety, ooh, that's not good. You haven't done blood gas on them yet. Um, let's say they fit the profile of somebody who's having an anxiety attack. You know, maybe they've had one in the past. 
Um, that kind of falls right in the range where we find those patients that are first time type 1 diabetics, really. So they present this way. One of the things we used to do, we checked their oxygen saturation, it's fine. Well, it's not an oxygenation issue, so uh, it looks like you're just hyperventilating a little bit. So years ago, they used to bring them to a bag, which is absolutely terrible. Don't ever do it. Don't ever have somebody do it. So, uh, because if you have this patient, you haven't done a blood gas yet, you haven't done a glucose yet, you haven't looked for a cause for their rapid breathing, and you have this patient breathe into a, ma into a mask that's not turned on to oxygen or to a bag, what's it going to do to them? So you have breathe into a bag, you say rebreathe your CO2. So if this CO2 right here, this is next level, but this starts to go up, 23, 25, 27. If that starts to go up, what's happening to their pH? It's dropping even farther. So they will crash. I mean, and they'll code. So this is one of those situations where they say, well, you know, I think this is a patient who has anxiety. You have to know, do they have a metabolic acidosis that's causing them to breathe like that? And it gets commonly overlooked. And then we kind of like happenstance kind of find it later on. Oh, shoot, we forgot to do a blood sugar. Oh, it was 750, you know, or something like that, you know. You have to make sure that before you make those interventions, you, look, you know what's going on with the body. This is the body's natural reaction to this. So the natural reaction to any acidosis, respiratory or metabolic, is to breathe faster. So make sure you, you figure that out. So that's my little plug for not using paper bags. So anyway, partially compensated, metabolic acidosis. Any questions about that at all? Yes? Um, how do you decide if it's respiratory or metabolic? Good. Okay, great. All right. So in this case, we're, gonna, we're going backwards. So we say acidosis goes here, and this one is, <clears throat> this is respiratory, because it's a CO2, and this is metabolic, since it's bicarb. So we see whichever acidosis or alkalosis matches the pH. So in this case, this is acidosis, this is acidosis, they match, so then we call it metabolic here. Did that help? Yes. Okay. There's always, that, that question gets asked every single time, so thank you for asking because somebody else was thinking it too. Yep. How do you tell the compensated one? Oh, okay, the compensated one. So what naturally happens in these cases, let, let's go, let's, let's kind of back up just a little bit. So, so we call this partially compensated. We call it partially compensated because we start with the acid, and we have an acid, and then we have an alk here. What's happening, what the system is trying to do, since your bicarb's low, your respiratory system is saying, there's acid in the blood, I'm going to breathe fast, and it's going down too. If the other one is outside of the normal range, it's considered compensated of some type. So, if I change this, that's compensated. You understand that? How it's on the alkalonic range of CO2? If I go to this, it's uncompensated. You understand that part? Kind of ish. So if I go to if I go to this is ridiculous. That's compensated. I mean it's it's over here in this alk range, it's over here. So the system's doing what it's supposed to do. Let me show you the next example, see if that helps. Okay, so next example is kind of the outlier. We'll take everything off of there. So, Whoa. okay, seven, three, five, sixty five, seventy, and thirty two. Let's go through it. So this is normal, right? Normal, acid, low, alk. Well, crud. Okay, so I can't put normal there, right? Because this, Dr. Camp's not going to make that answer. Normal, yeah, you don't get away with that one that easy. So you have to still call this something. So even though it looks like a normal gas because your pH is with normal limits, 
everything else is kind of whacked out. So in this case, if this comes up normal, we go by the center, 7.40. What side of 740 are we on? Acidosis. Acidosis side, okay. I'll go through this slow because this I don't lose anybody here. So we're on the acidotic side. What one do we blame it on? Respiratory or metabolic? Respiratory. respiratory, because respiratory is acid too, right? Since we say this is acidosis, respiratory is acid. And then what type of compensation do we have? Full. Full, and she's shaking her head, she's like, what? No, okay, so because I have a normal pH, fully compensated, so the body did what it's supposed to do. So, let's say 30 minutes from now, the patient is not ventilating well. We go from 65 and now we go to 70. So if this goes from 65 up to 70 and this doesn't change, it's okay if you don't really answer this, what's going to happen to your pH? It's going to drop, right? So if you understand that, that's really good. But when it drops, it goes to 7.32. Oh, now this changes our whole outlook here. So let's cross this stuff out. Let's do a new blood gas. 7.32. Acidosis, right? Six, it's, it's now 70. Is that acid, alk, or normal? Acid. Acid. This is low still. This is still out because we know black card doesn't change fast. So it's going to sit there and kind of think about what it needs to do. So which one matches, respiratory or metabolic? Respiratory. respiratory. Acidosis. And now, are we getting help from the other side? So is the other side outside normal range trying to offset the acid a little bit? Yes. Yes. So do we, do we call that fully, partially, or un? Partially. Partially. So. Now it changed to a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. Okay, yes. Um, so, what do you mean by like the other side? What is oh, okay, so when I say the other side. So there's two, si two sides. So think of this. This might help too. Uh, teeter I'm trying to draw a teeter-totter. <laughs> so you're teeter-tottering between HCO3 and P CO2, PCO2. So what happens is these, these fluctuate up and down, and the ultimate goal is for this to be 7.40. So when I say the other side moving, so if your CO2 your, your, and your ventilation, your CO2 is rising up, your bicarb also rises. So this is acid. Your bicarb rises alk, alkaline to make your pH 7.40. So it's rising with it. So if one side's going acidotic, the other better be going alkalotic. If one side's going alkalotic, the other side better be going acidotic. Because the goal is to get a perfect balance to be 7.40. How does that change? That might, you might, might stop and really think about that a little bit. Because if, if you think about like how each one of them changes, I've kind of went through that the whole time. But it is, it is kind of difficult to understand. When I say their side though, I mean one side's the respiratory side, one side's the metabolic side. And they're just trying to fix each other. Know the respiratory side fixes really fast. The metabolic side fixes a lot slower. That didn't help. I can tell by your eyes. I can't see my facial expression anymore, but I can tell by your eyes. I'm really trying. <laughs> that's okay. That's, uh, that's okay. No, it's absolutely okay. Other questions? Maybe, does anybody know a way that I, I can help to solidify it? Like, there's something you're not understanding. Yeah, okay, so yeah, maybe I can go with that, yeah. Never done it before, I'll do it though. So, uh, how does your body control the, the acid in all your body? You're, it's controlled actually in your stomach, because you know you have stomach acid. So have you ever heard of anybody overdosing? I never get that answer, but <laughs> let, me give, let me give this blood gas. I should have done it, dang it, I wish I would have done it without telling you. <laughs> 
So 7.56 40. Kind of weird. This is a super weird plug gas. You don't see it very often, but it definitely could happen. So let's go through this one. Alk, normal, normal, alk. Okay, so we have an alkalosis. And which one matches it, the metabolic side or the respiratory side? Metabolic. Metabolic, okay, good. Metabolic. Now, we need to ask ourselves the question over here. Are we getting help from the respiratory system? It has the respiratory system moved from its normal range to help out with this whole problem. No, it's still sitting at 40. It's sitting at normal. If it would have went up to 46, it would be compensated. It would be partially compensated. But it's not. It's still at 40. So this is uncompensated. It's metabolic alkalosis. Super rare. But the case that you were giving, somebody... Overdoses on um, overdoses on bicarb, which is essentially alka seltzer or bicarbonate or Tums. That's what I think of Tums. The Tums offsets acid. If you take a ton of Tums, you could do this because you're changing the acid, the acid base balance of your body and you become more alkalotic. Now, this, tell me, give me one reason why this probably wouldn't happen like this, this blood gas. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. remember I said respiration is always trying to fix the problem? Rarely is this going to sit here like this and not move. Unless they have something else they've taken to to suppress their respiratory drive. So that's, a bad, that's bad news. Yeah, but yeah, this wouldn't happen because, you know, you kick up and you breathe. Instead of 18 times a minute, breathe 22 times a minute. They'll fix it right off the bat because it'll, it'll breathe. The stuff will go down. I oh, know. No, you'll slow your breathing down and it'll go up. And then, um, but it just will take a few less respiratory respirations per minute. So I went the wrong way. A few less because it's just such a weird blood gas. <laughs> but, yes? We're at 15 minutes left. Okay, great. i answer the questions. Yep. Um, could you give us like numbers let's try it on our own? Ab so absolutely. Let me do one more real quick and then I'll do, let you do numbers. Okay. One more, because I have to show the, the really crazy one. Just because. <clears throat> okay. Bad news. Anytime you start getting a low sevens or below seven, I always think of this situation. I always think of every organ. It's not like you're just affecting the lungs. Every organ in their body is essentially...